So we're just out for a walk today from Hamble Marina, which is back that way. And we're just walking along the shore here. This is the shore of Southampton Water. So this is not the sea, this is Southampton Water Estuary. And over there we've got Hamble Oil Terminal Pier. And then we've got Forley Refinery over there. And then the old Forley Power Station over there. You can just about make out through the mist. It's a misty day, but it's very warm and mild, late March day. Really nice, but have a look at this. There's erosion going on here. This is not, these look like rocks, don't they? But they're not rocks. They're just big chunks of soil and turf. And what's actually happening here is at very high tides and during storms, there's a bit of a cliff here and it's eroding away and you can see the topsoil layer is there. You can see big chunks of topsoil there held together by the roots of grasses and plants and so on and that's what we're looking at here as well. These have washed out of the cliff. So yeah, erosion is an ongoing thing here. Anyway, we're going to walk along and see if we can find anything interesting on the beach. I'm looking in particular for shells that I can carve today. But we'll see what else we find. Interesting little pebble there. Probably some kind of fossil. Most of the rock here is flint, and so it's not really suitable for carving or working, crafting. What have you found? Oh, Jenny's just found something in the cliff. Let's go and have a look. Oh, biggies. Okay, this is cool. So what we've got here is bees. And I think they are looking to make little burrows in this cliff here. They're little solitary bees, not honey bees. But the place is absolutely buzzing with them. And you can see, I th think that is actually one of their holes there. Interesting. The whole of the cliff face, topsoil, is buzzing with these tiny bees. All the way along, in fact. There we go, there's a little hole there. Yeah. So I assume they are just looking for places to nest. So it might seem like a bad thing, really, that this beach is eroding away like this, but that's where the beach comes from. If this erosion was stopped, the tide will take this beach away, sort of longshore drift, and it will disappear there, and then there, wouldn't, there just wouldn't be a beach here. So it is a constant replenishment of the shingle and sand and clay that makes up this beach here. And washing out of here will be fossils and other things, mostly pebbles, but some fossils probably will be washing out of this shingle layer here. But you can see that obviously the sea comes right up to here because look at all the shells that have been washed right up against the cliff here. So the tide does come right up to the top of the cliff here and beats against that cliff face. So Jenny's found me a couple of cherry stone clam shells. I'm hoping they will be something I might be able to carve because there's really thick shell material on these. And we'll have a look around. There are oyster shells here as well, including live oysters. And we'll have a look and see if we can find some really thick ones that are worth crafting with. Okay, now down here we do have some live oysters. And so here we are. So that's a live oyster shell, right there. Now I'm not going to eat these oysters, obviously, for one reason, I don't, I'm don't. i not terribly fond of oysters, but also this is all a bit industrial here, and I don't think it would be a good idea to eat shellfish from this beach. However, 
I mean, the fact that there are live shellfish here, lots and lots of live oysters, does tend to indicate that it's not vastly polluted or else they'd all be dead from pollution. Lots of barnacles on the pebbles here as well and periwinkles. So quite a lot of shellfish living here. And we can see mussel shells around the place as well and lots of other clams and cockles and bivalves. Okay, so this is what we collected at the beach today. We've got lots of cherry stone clam shells, and these have a feel almost like ceramic. And I'm just hoping I can carve something out of these, but that's not for today. And then I've got a bunch of oyster shells, and some of these have got really nice thick pieces there. Hopefully not too flaky in there, and could be solid enough to carve something out of. Look at this one here. It's got a really thick chunk there, which I'm hoping I can carve into some sort of decorative piece. And I got this piece of tile. This is a piece of clay tile that is just black stoneware, I think. go at carving one of these cherry stone clams. It's quite a forgiving material and it carves very nicely and this is the end result here and it's ended up quite smooth in fact I think that would take a polish quite nicely. Obviously this is just proof of concept so it's a bit rough and ready still but it just goes to show you, you can actually carve designs on the outside of these shells and there's still plenty of thickness there so actually you could carve like a well, I mean, I guess we could do something a bit like a cameo or something maybe out of these shells. So there we go. Got plenty more of these to play around with, but those diamond wheels made short work of this. So I'm going to get some more diamond burrs and we'll have a go at carving something a bit more delicate and maybe a bit more refined than this. OK, just want to look at these which I picked up this morning. Now, I went off to a Mediterranean supermarket this morning in Portswood, Southampton hoping to find a drink called Shalgam, which is a fermented beet and turnip juice. Couldn't find any of that in the Turkish shop, unfortunately, but I did find these. These are called loquats, or Japanese meddlers. I think in Spanish they're called nisperos. Uh, they look a bit like apricots, don't they? And actually, you'd be forgiven for overlooking them, thinking that they are just nasty-looking apricots. But they are a different kind of fruit, and... It's kind of normal for them to look a bit beat up like this. They are quite delicate. They don't travel very well. And so in the UK, when we get them, they're very often a little bit bruised and beat up like this. But it doesn't really matter. They're still edible. Let's have a look at what this is. It is a relative of apricots and apples and cherries and plums and peaches. It's in the rose family. But it is a distinct kind of fruit. It's in a genus all of its own, Area Botria. Japonica, and it's got a kind of tough, slightly downy skin, a bit like apricots, 
but the flesh is very much more juicy than apricots. And in a minute we'll see what the inside looks like. It's got a, a one or more large seeds in there. Skin comes away quite nicely like that and you can see most of that bruising, although it's unsightly on the skin, it's not really reflected in any kind of damage internal to the fruit itself. As I say, very juicy. My hands are actually wet with juice at the moment. So let's open that up and see what it looks like in cross section. And there we go, there's a large stone. Whoops, I lost it nearly. And another one. Now some varieties have one great big seed in them. Some have five or six. That's very variable. And there is this kind of skin type stuff. Now you don't have to prepare it as, as delicately as I'm doing here actually. I'm being quite fussy really with this. You can just munch on these straight as they are. But I tend to enjoy them better if I take away some of this tough skin that surrounds the seed cavity. Like I say, you don't have to. It's really just me being a bit picky and fussy. So there we go, that's what they look like when they're peeled. Smell? Yeah, it smells like an apricot, but a bit more citrusy perhaps. And you can see it's very, very much more juicy than, than an apricot. I keep, I keep comparing them to apricots because of color, but they're really not that closely related. They are in the same botanical family as all of the apple family and rose family and so on, but um, not actually that closely related to apricots. Anyway, enough waffle, let's have a taste. Mm. They are so good. They're so juicy and just a little bit tart. Mm. If you imagine something like a peach that's been dunked in a mixture of lime and maybe tangerine juice. That's how I can best describe this. They've got that kind of peachy aroma that you might expect, but they've got a really sharp, fizzy almost, citrusy sort of taste. Mm. So let's, um, let's open up another one. They're, when they're ripe, they've just got a little bit of give to them here and yep so we can see another I will have to apologize for background noise if you heard that that's Eva yelling at another dog out the front window <laughs> I'm not going to edit that out because this is a random weekend video so there we go so that's another one prepared let's have a taste of that Mm. Now, interestingly, that one's got quite a bit more sweetness, also a little bit of astringency, and quite a bit more tartness as well. It's interesting. There's, a bit, there's so much variety from one fruit to the next on these. That's one of the things I like about them, actually, is that they are a little bit variable. And so in a bag of these, when you pick them up, you'll quite often get quite a variety of, of taste experiences just in one bag of fruit. Mmm. That one almost tasted a little bit like pineapple. So there we go, those are loquats, or Japanese medlars, or nisperos. Sometimes people call them Mediterranean quinces. The unusual thing about these is that they fruit at this time of year. So these are in season now, in April, and, these have, and the plants flower in November. They carry the young fruits through the winter, and then they fruit in early spring. So if you're anywhere near a Mediterranean food shop in the UK, you're likely to find these in stock right now. If you happen to be traveling to the Mediterranean region at this time of year, around about Easter, you're likely to find these in the market stalls in and around the Mediterranean. And I recommend that you try them. They're really an in interesting experience. Don't just pass these up as manky apricots. They are a different kind of thing. And I recommend that you try them. Now, what are we gonna do with these seeds? Well, you can't eat them because like most of the seeds in the apple family, they will produce cyanide in my gut if I were to try to eat them. So, however, we're gonna grow them. So we've got four seeds here. 
Just going to wipe the juice off them. Whoops. Just going to wipe that little bit of juice residue off them. Set the fruit aside. And I've got a pot of compost here that I've prepared in a bag. And we're just going to grow these now. I've grown these before. They're very, very easy to germinate. And like most large seeds with thin skins, they need to be planted while they're still fresh. You really shouldn't store these. You should plant, if you're going to plant seeds like, I mean, they're very much like a sweet chestnut. They've got a thin skin and inside there, there's a fleshy interior. They, they're not going to last. They're not going to store well. So they want to go straight in the soil and be planted now. I'm going to plant them to about probably their own depth again. So bury them by at least their own depth of compost. Just going to plonk them in there, evenly spaced around the pot. I'm not going to worry too much about getting them right or wrong way up because I don't know which way they want to be. If I put them down at least finger depth into the soil, they'll sort themselves out as they come up. And there we go. And so I'm just going to zip that up. The compost is already moist. The bag will keep it watered and moist and stop it from drying out. Every few days or so I might open that bag and let some fresh air into it. And we'll monitor that over the next few days and weeks on the random weekend videos. So there we go, that is uh, that is eating and growing the seeds of loquats, aka Japanese meddlers and all those other synonyms. Thanks for watching and I hope to see you again soon. Mm -hmm.